back let me put this here I became extremely impatient just now because everything is shut down on me and in fact I probably was still ministering up to 30 minutes after this thing went out <laughs> so I had to actually go back to the video and see where I left off because I was determined to complete part four today because part five and you know what for the devil donut I'm gonna add a part six to this how about that so I'm gonna add a part six to this just for him mess with me today everything just went out my power went out my cable went out everything just went out internet everything came back up had problem getting back on <clears throat> but we're back I was record I was sorry I was broadcasting also to Twitter and uh, Periscope but my second camera the signal just began to collide and all hell began to break loose so I'm gonna pick up from where we left off and what I'm gonna do is once I would have complete this particular session right here I'm gonna go back and actually because it's gonna be now be two videos which is uh, when when evil daughters are raised against churches part four but this part four will have part one and part two so I'll label it correctly so that you will know the difference so you don't have to worry about that <laughs> okay so this will be part two of when evil altars are raised against churches part four <laughs> okay so so we don't want to get confused there all right so in fact I was so frustrated I just took down everything and went said that I was so upset and I sat there and I said you know what no 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 come on Kev no 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 so I come and set everything right back up, and now we're back in business, all right? So let's pick up. Let's pick up from where we left off. I reviewed the, the, the video, and we left off where God told us that <coughs> when these wicked devils who uh, were among Israel, who were part of the church, was into their obeying wickedness, and the Lord finally take them off the scene, God says, do not go to their house to celebrate. Don't go there to mourn for them. Don't lament for them. In fact, listen what God said. He said, don't eat their food. Don't drink their drink. Now, why is he telling them this? Because like I said, just before I left off, they are neck deep. Yeah, even though the patriarch or the matriarch of the family uh, has died, oh, every seed produces after its kind. So those who are left obviously was introduced to that nonsense and they, 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 they upheld or uphold the same traditions and, and what have you. So let's go here to Jeremiah and we're going to continue at verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 16 and we're going to continue reading uh, verse 10. All right. So verse 10 of Jeremiah says, this God now speaking to Jeremiah. <coughs> He says, now when you tell this people all these words, they will say to you, for what reason has the Lord declared all this great calamity against us? And what is our iniquity or what is our sin which we have committed against the Lord our God? You know, this, 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 this particular passage of scripture, this verse here, really, it really gets me. Here is why. Because the people who are in the church, and that's what this represents, when you begin to talk about this, why are you talking about this? Ain't nobody near this do that. Furthermore, witchcraft only work if you believe in it. Why are you giving the devil so much credit? See, they're the type, watch what they're doing now. They're trying to remove the light off these things to keep you ignorant. They understand, the Bible says that the children of this world are wiser than the children of light, which are us. One of the reasons for that is that Christians always have their head, like the ostrich, in the sand. They don't want to confront these things. They don't want to speak about it. They don't want to discuss these things as if that's going to stop the trouble from coming. That's equivalent, right, to uh, a resident of a home. Hear the burglar breaking in the house. Hear the burglar setting up the shotgun. So what do they do? They take the sheet while they're in the bed and pull it over their head as if this could stop a bullet, as if this is going to deter the robber from coming to do what he or she came to do. So we, we cannot sit back any longer, man, and just continue to feed on milk. See, there's certain things we should have already been past. 
we should already been past God is going to turn it around. We should already been past the sermons which says, uh, okay, God is going to prepare a table before you in the presence. We, we've been seeing that. We, we've seen that, right? Some of us. So why you keep going on that mountain again? You should be on a higher level now. There's certain things you should just be beyond right now. You've been in the ministry for 15, 20 years, and you're still putting things on Facebook uh, God is going to get your enemies. That's the, the scripture says that. You have to put that there. That's what's going to happen. What have you learned since then? What uh, components of the spiritual world via this rule book have you now engaged in and take your battle to a different level? See, that is, this is how you begin to make the assessment of where you are as a Christian. Not only that, if God were to show you your dashboard and say, Kevin, listen, Let's say this dashboard is from 1 to 10. Kevin, you've been saved now for the past 15 years. But when I look at your dashboard as to where you should be, on this dashboard from 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, you're still at 2. What are you doing, Kevin? You know how many people should have been saved under your ministry, under your teaching, under your anointing, under your healing? Why are you still at 2? Well, Pastor, well, sorry, well, God, they didn't want to make me a praise and worship leader. What that have to do? So, so you only can do praise and worship in the church then? You, you can't get on the porch like Kevin do here and use technology and get my word on. You can't do that. See, you, they, see, there's no excuses. There's no excuses. So God says when you come to these wicked people and tell them what the judgment God is going to bring on this place, they're going to act foolish. They're going to act like, why would God bring this evil to us? In verse 11, listen what it says. It says, Then you, Jeremiah, are to say to them, It is because your forefathers, Oh Lord, y'all, please highlight verse 11 of Jeremiah 16. Please. I'm going to give you some time to highlight that. Verse 11 of Jeremiah 16. Because God now is about to tell them, why all this great evil is coming upon them. Okay, here we go. Just trying to make sure I up on up and running here. Cause I know the devil waking me hard today, but that's all right. We got something for him on his Grammy. <laughs> okay. So Jeremiah Chapter 16, verse 11. Okay, great. Listen to this. Remember, in chapter 10, God tells Jeremiah, he says, when you would have prophesied the judgment I'm about to bring on them because of the wickedness they're dealing with, they're going to act stupid. They're going to act like, how could this be? God, I mean, we serve you, Jesus. I mean, you know, we have the Holy Ghost every week. Every week we are slain in the Spirit. Every week we run our head into the bullet to show the people sitting in the pews that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. I mean, even though there ain't no healings and there ain't no miracles and there ain't no delivery, or sorry, deliverance, it don't matter. I mean, we, God, we are good at running around the church seven times. And, 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 and especially when Brother Philip crank up the music or, or on, the, on the drums and on the guitar, God, you have seen us in action. So God says, when they come to you with this stupidity, this foolishness, these asinine statements, I want you to tell them what you're about to read in Jeremiah 16 and 11 is the call of why everyone in the sick the church is becoming sick. Everyone is dying before their time. They're broke. They're busted. They're disgusted. They're frustrated. They're fatigued. People are leaving the churches in droves. He says verse 11 is going to tell you why. So verse 11 of Jeremiah 16 says, he says, Then you are to say to them, Jeremiah, this verse 11 now of, of, of Jeremiah 16, Then you are to say to them, It is because your forefathers or your ancestors have forsaken me. You hear that? God says to tell them this judgment is coming to them because they rejected God. Remember what I told you before. Whenever you see this statement in the Bible, and the children of Israel forsake God, or the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, both statements have one result. It means that they left God Almighty. 
the creator of all things, to serve idols, demons, evil spirits. They became grossly involved in the occult. So verse 11 says, he says, you tell them, he says, when, he says, then you are to say to them, which is the children of Israel, let's make this clear. Uh, Jeremiah 16 there is speaking of three, three, three groups here. God, the children of Israel, and Jeremiah the prophet. So God is speaking to Jeremiah what to prophesy to the people. To prophesy means to, 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 to speak on behalf of God of future events. So he says, tell Israel, not the, the, the evil people, not the people who, who to the Messianic Lodge, not the people who got the whole house down the road, not the adult, no, 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 no. He says, this is, these are my people we're talking about now. This is the house of Israel. In so much way, he's talking to the church, the, 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 the body of Christ right now. He says, I want you to tell them, when they say to you, how could these things be? Tell them because they no good Grammy, they no good grandpa, they ma, they brother, sister, were all involved in sorcery. They left me and decide to call up evil spirits to do their bidding. He said, that's why all of this, now he's talking to the church. Let's make this clear. Verse 11 is clear. He says here, then you are to say to them, Jeremiah, it is because your forefathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have followed other gods. Are you not reading that in your Bible? They have followed other gods and served them and bowed down to them. But me they have forsaken and have not kept my law. You too have done evil, even more than your forefathers. So God says, this judgment I'm going to bring on the church is because of two reasons. Number one, because your evil ancestors, your evil wicked ancestors put their hand to sorcery, put their hand to witchcraft, raising evil altars in the church, worshiping evil altars. He says, but not just them, even you, the current generation, all of those evil, your Grammy, your, your, your daddy, your whomever passed on to you. You the, the one, were the one that was next in line to continue the, the, the black arts, uh, continue operating from the five books of Solomon's, continue calling up spirits and walking in the graveyard naked and, and, and doing fool. He says, you, the current generation now, you are now practicing what your forefathers did. All of this is why he's bringing this judgment. He says, you too have done evil, even more than your forefathers. For behold, you are each one walking according to the stubbornness, stubbornness of his own evil heart, without listening to me. Verse 13 of Jeremiah 16 says, so I will hurl you out of this land, into the land which you have not known. But this ain't no shocker. This ain't no shocker. Remember before the children of Israel. I think it's in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Before the children of Israel uh, had possessed the land, the promised land, uh, Moses began to, in the Levitical laws, tell them things that they shouldn't be doing. You should not sleep with your brother or your sister. Don't have sex with your mommy and your daddy and all these other things. And they were like, why are you telling us? We wouldn't do nothing like this. And he says, the reason why I'm telling you not to do these things is because the Canaanites are currently doing these things in the land of Canaan. Watch what it says next. And because of this great evil, because all of what they were doing were worship to their gods, orgies, having sex with necks of kin. All of that was worship to, towards their God. And the scripture says, God says, because they have done this, the land, listen carefully, has spewed them out. So the land that was supposed to serve them has now rejected them because of the great evil evil and atrocities that they were committing. So God is telling Israel the same thing. Because of the iniquity in terms of sorcery of your forefathers and plus yourself, he says that the land is about to reject you. Watch what it says here next now. It says, you too, this verse 12, you too have done evil even more than your forefathers. For behold, you are each one walking according to the stubbornness of your own heart, evil heart without listening to me. So I will hurl you out of this land into the land which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, 
and there you will serve other gods night and day. For I will grant you no favor. So the bottom line is this. God is not playing with Israel. God says, I'm, I'm tired of you coming to church every Sunday and putting on a performance. You just walked out the witchcraft man house the night before. Okay? You just went and gave your, your sacrifices, chicken, goat, and whatever else. And now you come into the house of God and you're inviting people up to the pulpit only to rest here. Now they believe you call them up to pray healing on them. They believe you call them up to release a spirit of peace. But what they don't know is you are about to initiate them to your altars. So this is why the beginning of Jeremiah 16, it talks about the outbreak of sicknesses and disease in the house of God. It also talk about the poverty that was accompanied to all, with all of them as a result of serving other gods, which is equivalent to serving idols, sorry, serving altars. See, because there can be no sorcery, there can be no witchcraft, voodoo, obia. None of these things can be achieved outside the erection, er, erecting sorry, of an altar. So the altar is a place where divinity which is the spirit world, meet with humanity, which is us. The altar is the place where destinies are changed. The destiny of a church, the destiny of an individual, the destiny of a family. An altar is a place where evil patterns originate. Everybody getting sick, everybody getting a divorce. Nobody could be successful over the age of 50. When you see these negative patterns in your church, when you see your elders falling sick of diseases and there's no recovery, no amount of healing, what makes it even worse when the leaders, when the leaders sweep these things under the rug and still asking you for money, still asking you to pay, I mean, contribute towards the building. Nobody is saying, you know what? Enough is enough. Let us get together. Let us cycle this church. Let us ask God to make the ground vomit, whatever was planted here. Let us ask God to send the fire of God to break the curses, the bands of wickedness through sorcery. Let us ask God to expose that person in this church, doing it just like how Achan was exposed in the time of Jericho. No. So when you find the leaders are oblivious and blind to the obvious, and if there's anyone who should see is them because they're the spiritual leaders, you got a problem. One of two things going on here. Either that leader is very much involved, or the leader has been bewitched through those who are erecting altars in that place or against that place. So all the leader now thinks about is they figure they have enough money. They figure once they get this church finished, they figure once they get the bus for the church, they figure once we could uh, tile the floor, then things can be better. No, 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 no. The, uh, the, the first order of a church is a spiritual order. That's what you're there for. That's what the church is about. So this is why you've been tithing there like crazy. This is why you give your first fruit, last fruit, third fruit, second to the last fruit, uh, turn over seven times, somersault, and run forward fruit, and nothing has happened. The fellow on your job who won't serve God, getting blessed with bonuses, promotion, advancing in life, and you who putting every penny in that place, becoming worse and worse and worse and worse because you don't understand that there's an altar that has altered your destiny because of your commitment to that place, which is curse under the guise of the house of God. We can read it. We can read some more of it right now. So God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 16, he said, Jeremiah, listen to me. He said, don't marry nobody of Israel at this point. Don't have no children with those women. Don't do nothing with them. He says, because sickness is going to fall on them. Poverty is going to become, their bent, become, going to become the, the poster child for them. He says, they're going to die like nobody business. He said, they're going to die like nobody's business. And no one is going to be able to help them. 
Because what you don't know, sorry, what they don't know, Jeremiah, is that the very people in the house of God, ain't nobody on the outside, the people in the house of God, this wasn't going on just today, Jeremiah, their ancestors was working witchcraft right there in the church. Their ancestors telling them, put on this red cloth when you come to prayer meeting. Their ancestors say, let the whole church go down by the sea or by the river or by some large body of water and do a ritual. That time they're surrendering you over to the altars of the ocean, the altars of the river, the altars of the sea. They're telling you, you will move that evil spirit out of your house. Listen to what the church people are telling you now. Listen to what the leaders say. Go get some sea water and mop your floor with it. Go get some turpentine, put the black string, put some garlic on your poison, get some uh, uh, ammonia and, and do it around the, 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 the borders of your house and on the inside. Put some salt on the corners of your... Where in the scriptures are, are you getting this, this information, ma'am, sir? So you are so deep. They got you so deep into this. You don't, you're so silly. Because you're going on every, you won't check in the scriptures. You don't, in fact, you don't open the Bible no more. In fact, they don't preach from the Bible no more. Everything, and this is how you know the church is under a curse. Everything they ever talk about is blessing, money. God is getting ready to promote you. They will never tell you the obstacles that are going to challenge you. That's not a balanced gospel. How, okay, if my blessing is two minutes away from me, but there's 60 million devils just waiting to intercept. You never told me about that. So I'm in ready mode now, okay? And just when I'm about to receive it, the devil's carry it. Okay, what did I do now? Because you never told me what to do to stop them. And you surely never told me what to do after they didn't get it. No, man. No, no. The church is under a curse. The evil altars of that church is dictating the course of that church. Everyone in that church is blind. Just like in Galatians 3 and 1, O foolish Galatians, listen to the, the witchcraft word, who has bewitched you? The word bewitch means who has placed you under a spell. That also means you were not this way. You were not always this way. Who have you allowed to come in here, set up an altar, and put a curse on everybody? Remember in my last teaching, God told uh, the children of Israel, to, to who was about to, uh, watch the walls of Jericho fall down. He says, do not touch anything in there because those items are cursed, meaning that they, every item in the walls of Jericho, they used to worship their demonic gods, their idols. These were the things they had on their altars. God says, do not touch it, for they are a curse. Because if you take it, least or unless you become a curse. I told you the meaning of that word. The Hebrew word is cherens, and the word means mark for destruction. So what God was saying to Israel, if you decide to disobey me and touch and take or take of these occultic items in Jericho, which are cursed items, which are marked for destruction in his original understanding, he said, now you now going to become marked for destruction. In the realm of the spirit, there's a mark on you. He is free to attack. His family is free to attack. The church that he is at, we are free to attack it because they have our paraphernalia there. So this is why, this is why if you go into a church and the church, this is one of the key factors to look at. When that church is off course, rather than telling you, take this scripture and let us meditate on the scripture. Let us pray the scripture. Let us sing the scripture. Let us repeat the word of God. Instead of them doing that, you know what they do? They say, okay, Everyone who's coming in the church today, we're going to give them a dollar. And this is a signal that God is going to bless you. Or they get some pennies that they either throw among the crowd or ask you if you want to break the poverty in your life, come take up one of these pennies. Or When you see rituals like that that are unbiblical, you are being tied to an altar. You know what's going to happen now, especially if money's involved? All of your spiritual finances, there's an exchange being done. There's a spiritual exchange that you cannot see that is going to drain you financially, spiritually, and make them wealthy. Two stories I can tell you right now in the Bible that speaks to this. The first one is in, I think, Leviticus chapter 19. And this is where the atonement of sin, where the high priest would come and get a, a goat or a sheep or whatever, a, a, a clean one and a dirty one or whatever. And how Aaron would have to put his hand on the goat to transfer, watch this now, the iniquities and the sins 
unto the goat. And how is this being done? How could you do that? How could you transfer sin? I'm showing you the spiritual stuff that you don't understand. But right there in the Bible, go read it. Leviticus chapter 19. And it says that the man had to been ready that after he would have already transferred the sins, iniquity, and transgression of the entire Israel as a part of the atonement upon this goat that they had to take it out into the wilderness. We look there in the New Testament when the man who was packed with the legions of spirits and this, the evil spirits bargain with God and says, Lord, bargain with Jesus and says, Jesus, please don't send us from here. What did Jesus do? They say, send us into the, the pigs. Watch how now the spirits are going to be transferred from a human being. The Bible say over 2,000 of them. And then it was passed on to who? It was passed on to the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the evil spirits were passed into the, the pigs. So that's two instances where transferring a spirits, but that is a principle. This is what I'm trying to get you to look at. So therefore, when a church or any place that call themselves a church is asking you to participate in something, come and take this or drink this or rub this on you. I'm not talking about regular anointing with olive oil. I'm not saying that. Those things are quite legitimate in its setting. But where they're asking you to take this penny, take this dollar, or whatever it is, or bend down and get this, and that represents the Lord blessing you, uh-uh. You are being initiated into altars. You are being initiated into altars. Now, let's prove this to you. Because remember, the entirety of this teaching is based on not people who we know to be evil workers. This teaching, again, is when evil altars are raised against churches. That is the whole uh, idea of this teaching. And you need to know that even though you go into a church to hear from God, the reality is, <clears throat> even though you, you, you go into a church to hear from God, the reality is the place that you call the house of God is a den of devils. So this is why this teaching is so important. You, you have to understand that the church has been inf infiltrated with evil. But this is not new because we're reading from the Old Testament where it has been happening. So this, there's nothing new here. There is absolutely nothing new here that you're hearing. So I want us to pick up from where we left off the last time. Because I know you probably thought I forgot. <laughs> and we left off we were reading Ezekiel chapter 8. And Ezekiel chapter 8 starts off when we left off from verse 12. But I'm just going to give you a recap. In fact, let's read it. Let's read it. Let's read it. So we could get a full clarity on what's happening here. What Ezekiel chapter 8 is going to show us now is going to become the basis of everything I just talked about. How evil people have infiltrated the church and set up altars. But in this particular scripture, you're going to see, this is a real story. But what happened in here is God is going to take Ezekiel's spirit out of his body and take him into the realm of the spirit and show him the things that the elders of Israel were doing, even though they call themselves prophet, even though they call themselves uh, his grace, her grace, pope, apostle. And again, I want you to hear me. I'm not making mockery of a title. All a title is, is to reveal structure. A title don't mean power. Title is to give structure. If there's a bishop, then there's got to be someone under the bishop, there's got to be someone under the task. All the title is, that got nothing to do with the power. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Now remember, we left off at verse 12 in the last teaching that I did last week. But I'm just to recap, I'm going to read here in verse, beginning at verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 8. And it says, it came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in my house. Now, this is Ezekiel now. I want you to get the story. Ezekiel is sitting in his house with the elders of Judah sitting before him. So right now, I'm in front of the table. And where this camera is, it's across this table. So this camera would be the elders of Israel sitting in the house of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is sitting across from them. So this is physically happening. This is real. Just like how you see me right now. This is real. So Ezekiel now says, watch this now. In verse, 
They came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in, the, in my house with the elders of Judah, sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell on me right there. Watch this now. Then I looked, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man from his loins and downward. There was the appearance of fire, and from his loins and upward, the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. Now, obviously, this is not a human. Verse 3. He, this is the spirit now, he stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my head. Listen carefully. By the lock of my head, and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the vision of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court. So at this point, and this is why I'm putting emphasis on this story, at this point where the Spirit lifted him up, none of this is physical. He is now in a vision. His physical body is still in his house. His physical body is still across from the elders of Israel. But God has taken his Spirit out of him and transported him supernaturally to the city of Jerusalem. And God is about to expose these elders, these church leaders, what they really into. So, but God is going to show them everything we are about to read right now. I want to be at the forefront of your mind. It's spiritual. There is nothing physical about it. Just like we had, a, I told you, in my, if you read the, if you watch the last video, I told you about the dream that I had about the particular churches here and how God, through the dream, began to reveal to me the homosexuality and witchcraft that these churches in this island of Grand Bahama are involved with. <clears throat> so, Verse 3 says, this, this angel or spirit, he stretched out the hand, he stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by a lock of my head, and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. Remember, in the visions of God. This is not flesh and blood participating here. I'm, I'm putting emphasis on this because I need you to get your mind in the, in the gear of this is spiritual, just like your dream. All right. <clears throat> Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the vision of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the seat of the idol of jealousy which provokes to jealousy was located. So there was an idol and you walk into the courts of Jerusalem there was an idol but here is what I want you to get this idol was not visible. There was a spiritual idol that they came there and they made signs too. People might have been looking at them like, why do you, I guess these people are so holy, you know? Just like when they do the, you ever see the Catholic guys do this stuff? And there's a lot of history behind that too, which is very similar to what we're talking about right now. So here it is, they're making their signs and incantation to an invisible idol. This cannot be seen. Remember, God took Ezekiel in the realm of the spirit and allowing him to see things that he could not see neither other people around there could see under normal circumstances. Only those, the elders of Israel and those who were involved in sorcery knew that this idol was there, this invisible idol. Listen to what it says next now. <coughs> it says in verse 4, and behold, the glory of the and behold the glory of the God of Israel was there like the appearance which I saw in the plain. Verse 5 of Ezekiel 8. Then he said to me, Son of man, it's the spirit now, the angel talking to Ezekiel. Son of man, raise your eyes now towards the north. So I raised my eyes towards the north, and behold, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy. Now, let me explain what the idol of jealousy means. Remember, the Bible says that God is a jealous God, right? So if no other God or idol besides him. So when you get a term, uh, idol of jealousy, it's really talking about a shrine or an altar or, or some idol they had set up there but again, this was invisible only those who are part of it it's almost like Freemasons, they know what they're dealing with, they know what their signs mean, they know what is what the average, that's why it's called a secret society so in this case here, we could say the secret society had infiltrated the church, okay he goes on to say here, 
in uh, verse 5 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now towards the north. So I raised my eyes towards the north, and behold, to the north of the altar, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel, listen, listen these are regular people, which the house of Israel are committing here, so that I would be far from my sanctuary, but yet you will see still greater abomination. Again, God is showing Ezekiel spiritual things. That the elders who were currently sitting in his house, he had no knowledge of what the elders really were dealing with. None. Until God began to show him in the spirit. Verse 7 says of Ezekiel 8. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Now, this is all spiritual. So God brought him to the to court. And in the wall he saw a little hole. Watch what happens next. He said to me, son of man, now dig through the wall. We saw the hole. So I dug through the wall and behold an entrance. Verse 9 of Ezekiel 8. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing here. So I entered and looked and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things, which all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the walls all around. Standing in front of them were Seventy elders of the house of Israel, or seventy pastors of the house of God, with Je Jezaniah and the son of Shephan standing before them, each man with his censer in his hand, and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. So you see, they're in the house of God. But in the house of God, in a secret compartment, these fellas had their idols. These fellas was working their witchcraft. These fellas was doing their evil. Remember the dream I told you last week about the particular church right here. I said I was standing, looking at the church, observing, and all of a sudden this whirlwind-like force grabbed me and took me to the foundation of this building, deep within the earth, under this building. I don't know where I got the knowledge from, but in the dream, where I was in this room, under the church, I was right above the pulpit. And in this room, there were no windows, there were no doors. And the whole room was a four-wall room. Each room, each side of the wall, had a, they had a, like a little torch with little dim light. And I could see these books, these tall books, from the top to midway uh, in the walls. The books were like three to three and a half foot tall, feet tall. And you had to literally pull down. All the books were attached to some kind of electrical uh, rod. And you could only pull down one book at a time. And when I pulled the book down and opened the book, I saw what was written in Latin and what was written in English. And on the next page, it had all of these instructions of diagrams on how to practice witchcraft. Each book had a heading, witchcraft. Each book was a greater level of witchcraft than the previous book. But this is under this particular church, deep down, probably about 100 feet under the foundation. No rooms, no doors in this place. This is the exact thing that God did with Israel, I mean, Ezekiel. Showing him in the spiritual realm what he couldn't see in the physical realm that is going on in the church. So we're going to pick up from verse 12 where we left off last week. So verse 12 says of Ezekiel 8, he says, Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark, each man in the room of his cra graven, craven image? Sorry, carved image. For they say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, Yet you will see still greater abominations which they are committing. Remember, these are the people you call pastors. Now, I'm not saying all pastors are like this. I'm not saying all bishops are like this. These teachings are to show you what to look for so you could know if a church have evil altars raised against it. Now, if you want to remain uh, naive and continue going there, well, that's up to you. 
Verse 14 says, Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house. Listen to this now. Which was towards the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz. Tammuz is an idol god. So the women were crying to this idol god. Verse 15 said, He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than these. Then he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, between the porch and the altar were about... Sorry, let's take it again from verse 16. Then he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men, with their backs to the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east. And they were prostrating themselves eastward towards the sun. He said to me, Do you see the Son of Man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? That they have filled the land with violence. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Who is he blaming for all of the violence and the sickness and the disease and all of these stuff breaking up the land? The people of the church, the house of Israel. He said the spirits that they have invited has now spread their tentacles out and causing all the havoc. But you say it was the old bear man. You say it was this man. Yeah, they, they could bring some spirits too, but they're limited. But when the people of God, the ones who were put in place to shut these things down, actually begin to become the pace setters of it, oh, you got this is a different kind of evil now. This, this ain't your regular evil. So the scripture is saying that these wicked people are the ones who are causing all of this evil to break loose in the land. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I don't know. Take a look at your land. But now compare it to the, to the billions of churches they got in that one particular place. Now it makes sense. How come all of these churches in our country, how come all of these churches in our community, how come all of these churches all around the place, the greater church of ascension, the, the this, the that, and there's more evil crime, witchcraft, murder, AIDS, cancer, heart disease, heart attacks, high blood pressure, cholesterol. You have more of that than any other time in spite of the churches that are in that place. So what does that say to you? It now speaks. Remember I told you, this now becomes the benchmark. This now explains to you why. And what is the why? The church is the source of it. There are people in there who name the name of God. There are people in there who claim to be sold out to Jesus. There are people in there who wear the long clothes and the little, the women don't come in there without something covering it. They follow all of the so-called exterior rules, but only to throw you off. And they can't wait for night to fall to go into their home and pull out their caldrons to, to bring out their altars with the candles and people pictures and underwears and the pastor uh, uh, personal effects. They're sending curses because of the altars they set up against that church. People wake up. People you will never... Listen to me here. Yeah? While you may be safe, <coughs> while you may love God, the quality of your life is simply based on this book right here. Being saved will never make you rich. Being saved will never stop sickness from coming to you. Being saved will never fix your marriage. Being saved will not make you prosperous. No. Being saved simply means that you followed the principle to have a seat in heaven with God. The scripture is clear. The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you are now saved. The scripture never said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're going to become debt free. You're going to become free of sicknesses. You're going to live a process. You'll never read that. No. That part, that's the second part now. The second part is to receive the healing, to receive breakthroughs and financial debt and so on. You have to abide by these rules. You have to follow these rules and now this will improve the quality of it. But being a Christian alone doesn't do it even though you've been told that. So this is what I'm saying to you. They're asking you to give the seed and give that seed, and, and nobody is saying, well, you know if your heart ain't right, you're really wasting your time here. 
You know, if you're full of anger and bitterness, God ain't hearing you. Because the scripture says, and this is why I tell you, you have to preach a balanced gospel. The scripture says in Psalm 66 verse 18, he says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. In Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, he says that, for the Lord hands is not sure that he cannot reach you, his ears ain't clogged, that he cannot hear you. But your iniquity has separated you from your God. The Bible says in our Psalms, sorry, Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13, it says that he that hideth his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesses his sin, mercy shall he have. I don't know who I'm speaking to. You, you probably just tune in at the right time. But more than likely, the place that you call church, don't mind how mega the church is, don't mind how small the church is. Based on these teachings, and I admonish you to go over them and listen to them again. Use it as a benchmark as it relates to the place that you're at. The fruits that they are producing, use this to judge those fruit. Why every time I have to sow a seed for God to meet my need? How come I don't see this when Ezekiel was alive and the account of Ezekiel, when Jehoshaphat, when Jehoshaphat had the three nations coming against him? the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the children of Mount Seir. How come he didn't ask Israel to raise a seed offering? Instead, he tell them to go on a fast, and when they went on a fast, God sent a prophet and tell them that uh, there's no need for them to fight in this battle, uh, for the Lord will deal with them. How, okay, how come when, when, when Jeremiah and, and Isaiah, when, when all of the other kings of Israel that live for God and, and evil come against them. They never said, let, let us read it, raise a special seed, a thousand dollar seed offering so God to overthrow our enemies. No, 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 no. Listen to what they said instead. I think it's second of First Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, oh, 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 if who to keep my people, who the people of God, if my people, read the rest of the scripture, but I can hang out right there to my people. He didn't say if the people of the land stop doing wickedness. He didn't say if the pimp stop pimping women. He didn't say if the adultery stop committing adultery. No, he brought it right back to his church, his people. They were the ones that were causing all of the evil in the land through the wickedness they were involved in. If my people that are called by my name will humble them. Listen what he's saying. He didn't say if the Satanist would humble himself and get saved. He didn't say if the liars would stop lying. Everything begins and ends with the house of God as it relates to the things negatively going on in your community or positively. The people of God, they're the ones who are not doing or carrying out the charge that they were supposed to be carrying out. They're too busy trying to big build big buildings. They're too busy trying to, to be secular. Everything that they bring in the church is of a secular nature. You see, to me, and, and I'm, I, I become so angry about it because it's like they're under a spell, like they cannot see the, the city for the smoke. But the scripture is clearly revealing to you. So many pastors I know are involved in divination. So many false prophets traveling the length and the breadth of the Caribbean, the Bahamas, you name it, with a whole heap of lies and false prophecies, just tying up people, prophesying over them, evil prophecy and these people have no idea that they're being initiated to the altars that these evil so-called prophet and prophetess serves they don't know that and what when i speak about it and give all the scriptures on it or don't mind him he's a hater i'm a hater trying to show you how to break the bonds of wickedness on your life father i pray right now that whoever is listening to me that the spirit the, the spirit of spiritual insight that you gave to Ezekiel and saw e caused Ezekiel to see in the spiritual world what he couldn't see regular, regularly. The same spiritual insight that you placed on me and showed me in the spirit so many churches on this island alone that's involved in sorcery and the people of those places. Father, those who have received your word today, I pray for a double portion of this spirit of spiritual insight upon their lives. Father, now I speak to every evil altar that has been speaking to their destiny, that has hijacked their destiny. I command those evil altars to be silenced by the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, according to your word in Colossians chapter 3, 
2. And it's 2 and 13. It says that for the handwriting that was written against them has been blotted out because of what you have done on the cross. Every evil covenant that has been written against them via the evil deeds of their forefathers and ancestors. Father, I pray that those evil covenants be destroyed by your eternal fire right now. Father, I release the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that they will not be robots. They will not be puppets in these places going along with the program when the quality of their lives are being ripped away. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that spiritual insight, spiritual order, spiritual revelation, knowledge, wisdom, understanding will be their portion because they decide to follow not me, but to follow your word. I pray, Lord, that you would destroy the spirit of ignorance that has encompassed them as a result of the spell that they are under, under those places that you have no dealings with. Father, I pray that that thing that has been gnawing at them, that something is wrong, give them revelatory insight. Give them spiritual ears that they would hear, spiritual eyes so they may see, and spiritual understanding so they may comprehend what you've been revealing to them. Now, Father God, I pray by the blood of Jesus and by the power of your spirit that you will bring judgment on those people who blatantly decide to practice sorcery in your place of worship and enslave your people to a life of difficulty. Father, I pray that you bring them to open shame and disgrace. In fact, I pray Psalms 109 verse 17, which says that he that loveth curses, then let those curses come upon him. And he that delighted not in blessings, then let those blessings be far from him. Psalm 7 says, let their own wicked dealings, those evil pastors and apostles, those who want to stand up on pulpits, who are full-fledged and mason and secret societies and calling themselves bishop and apostle and so on, bring judgment to them, Father God. Show them that your house is not a house, no dolly house. This isn't a house of games and mockery. So, Father, I pray by the Spirit of the living God that you will do a cleaning up. Just like how you told Jeremiah, don't fool up with none of them in there because your judgment is coming. But, Father God, just like in the days of Noah, when Noah and the other seven that were with him believed you and were saved, then allow those who are ignorant to these things in those places be released from the penalty and the punishment that's going to come to those who insist on mixing darkness with light. Father, I pray right now as we continue in these series that your anointing of wisdom, your anointing of knowledge, your anointing of understanding will march and be the leader as you lead me to teach your people. I pray for those right now who has been riddled with demonic attacks all because of the place that they are in, that because of the evil altars that are in that place, they cannot go forward. Father, I bless you. Father, I honor you. Father, I praise you. And I glorify you. And ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, before I close out today, I want to tell you about a dream that I had about another church on the same island of Grand Bahama. It has nothing to do with the church that I told you about last week and even today, which have sister churches. This church, last year, uh, my wife and I, we were in the Turks and Caicos doing, a, Grand Turk to be specific, a week of services on our, our evil altars. And the, the night before we, we wrapped up, I had this dream. And in this dream, there was this well-known pastor, very, very well-known here in the island of Grand Bahama. But he was in the Turks and Caicos. In fact, in the dream specifically, he was on the island of Provo or Providenciales. And he was in the settlement of Blue Hills, which is where I, I grew up with my, my, uh, my, my grandmother on my father's side when I was a young boy. And he was up on this high hill. On this high hill, there was this building. But the building was a small, like, shack. But everyone in this neighborhood knew that this was the place that you go to, to seek help from the spirits, evil spirits. So I'm at the foot, I'm literally at the foot of this steep, steep hill. And I mean, there was a long staircase. So I saw this pastor, very well known. 
I watched this pastor coming down. He had two like armor bearers with him. He was wearing a cape. This is so interesting. Of a short cape. The inside of the cape was red, but the black was the, the sorry, the, the exterior of this cape was black and the collars were flipped up. And he had like this little button here. And he's coming down the stairs very prideful. And he's literally taking his feet and just like he's walking on air. He's, he's just turning every little minute, like priming up, like he's taking pictures, but there's no one taking his pictures. And he's looking at me and I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, man, check out the sky, man. So he's walking out of this witchcraft haven now with these two little aids he got with him. These two little armor bears or whatever. And I'm looking at this guy and I cannot believe I know where this guy come from. I know how powerful he was. And I can't believe this guy is resorting to evil powers. So as he's coming down, he's priming up and he's just throwing his cape from one side to the next. One side to the next. But guess what? I watch him take a misstep. And I literally watch this well-known pastor begin to tumble down these steep... Uh, it, was a, it was in cement staircase. It's like they, they hewed the steps out. And I listened to this guy tumble and tumble to all of his head and stuff got wrapped up in his cape. And all I heard was his neck crack. And by the time I got there, this pastor, whose face should be in front of him, was literally turned almost like a 180 degree dead with his tongue hanging out of his head and his eyes wide open. The whole setting of this dream was dark, but I could see everything. And I'm watching the people looking. No one is coming to his help. No one is coming to aid him. I woke up that morning. I told my wife about the dream. She said, Kevin, you, you, what you think about it? I said, Deidre, this guy is full of pride. This guy is into the occult. And the Lord is going to judge him. I prayed for this man. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, should I go and tell him? I Should I go and share this with him? I never got the release to go to this day. But I could tell you right now, again, just like how God showed Jeremiah, just like how God showed Ezekiel, what he's going to do to the leaders of his house that is misleading his people, this is a modern day scenario right here. If this particular pastor don't get his act together, he is going to die, not only on an, an unexpected death, but a death that just will not be able to be understood. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord has now intervened and God has had enough of this guy. So I'm saying to you, and I pray, pray with me also that God give me the release if he so desire. I've seen the pastor since, and in fact I spoke with him, but I never brought it up, never told him about it. And when I saw him, in fact, when I spoke with him the last time, I mean, the, the stench of his pride was incredible. And I was saying to myself, I see why God hasn't released me to talk to this man as yet. So I'm saying to you right now, listen to me, pray for your leaders. Pray, ask God, Father, if my leaders involved with this, Father, bring a change of heart. The scripture says, I think it's in Proverbs 21, if I'm not mistaken, verse 1, it says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And as a river turneth, so does God turn the heart. Let's pray right now, Father, we pray for the leaders of our particular uh, sanctuaries. We pray for those up and coming leaders. We pray for those leaders that are on their way out. Father, before you bring judgment to them, give them a heart to repent to you and to release themselves from the evil that they have caught themselves in. Many pastors, many bishops, many of them, especially in the Baptist, and I'm not afraid that it's especially in the Baptist Association, who are tied uh, to, to evil altars, true messianic lodge and secret societies. No, the scripture made it clear in the book of Corinthians 10 and 20. It says that you, you, you should have no dealing, no light should have dealings with darkness. He says the sacrifices that the Gentiles make, those who are outside of the body of Christ, he says that they make sacrifice to devil, 2 Corinthians 10 and, and, and 20. So why are you bishop? Why are you pastor? Why are you apostle? Why are you chief apostle? practicing in secret societies and calling yourself a child and even more so a leader of God's kingdom or his people. God is going, you could hate me, you could send me all the hate mail you want, but if you die and find yourself in a Christless hell, you would wish you could hear this message again.
Turn your life over to God. Stop leading God people astray. Stop sending them to the altars of sacrifice and changing their destiny for wealth and riches. And to enrich yourself through demonic spiritual means. God, as sure as my name is Kevin L.A. Ewing, God is going to judge you. You pastors who are out there pillaging the people of God, raping them of their finances. You don't have no altar calls. You don't tell them about their souls. You don't tell them about generational curses. You don't tell them about, you don't tell them about nothing. All you say to them and make life seem to be this black and white thing. You give your money and God can give you this. It is a lie. There is nowhere in the rule book where God is requiring his prophets to be paid in order to release a word to the people. Any way you find that you are in a den of devils, get out right now. I don't care how big the church is. I don't care how prosperous they may look. They are operating under satanic powers and it's time to leave. False prophecies gone to bed, like we say in the Bahamas. Everything is gone. I see wedding. I hear wedding bells. I see where you get no promotion. Nobody is saying, you know what? I see if you don't get your life right with God right now, I see you coming to an end. I see your family being under the powers of darkness. If, if, if X, Y, no one is telling you that. No one. Well, I'm going to tell it to you. And before I close out today, I pray to God that this message would convict you if you are not a Christian to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to enrich yourself with the knowledge of God, to improve the quality of your life. Don't listen to these clowns talking fool to you, but you got to sow a thousand, sow 500. Again, let me make this clear. I am not against sowing. I believe in sowing. No church can advance without the, the, the material means, such as finances, to advance the cause of God in the earth. What I am saying to you is when you have to pay for a prophecy, pay for a word of God, buy oil, buy a miracle cloth. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. When uh, Peter and, and them had the, the handkerchief and was giving it for the people, to be, I never heard where he charged them for it. Never read it. Never read it. But anyway, I'm done with that. So I'm done. And tomorrow, we're going to jump on part five. Remember, because the devil ticked me off today, I had another one on this, so we can do part six too. So take that, devil. So, so tomorrow, tomorrow, we're going to do part five of this. And we're going to go into even deeper revelation. Like I told you last week, what we did today, we just scratched in the surface. We are about to go into the scriptures tomorrow and unearth some stuff. Just like how we had it today, we had some deep revelations today. But we're going to go even deeper tomorrow. So God bless you. May the peace of God be with you and your household. I thank you all who have blessed my ministry. You have been tremendous and has put me in a position to upgrade my equipment. So many things I was able to do with my ministry because of your donations. As you can see, I don't beg you for no money. You will never, ever, ever hear Kevin ask you to send him no seed. It will never happen. Because I believe when you do the word of God, God will touch the heart of his people to bless you. And that's been happening to me. And that is the kind of trend that I want to lead. I'm not begging you for no money. I'm not telling you to send no seed for God to meet you. It is garbage. It is nonsense. It is lies. No. But what I would say to you is you adhere to the rule book. This here. I will always push you to this right here. So you have a good evening. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.